Hey folks, uh, we're getting close to the end of sonnets. Uh, I got two more for you today, and then we're going to move on to other things uh, from the Renaissance. Uh, however, uh, before we move on to other things from the Renaissance, next week I'm going to ask you to write a sonnet. Uh, and I'm going to give you all the rules and, and send you on your way to try and do this. You'll be able to work with a partner. Uh, so you definitely want to pay attention to the sonnets that we're reading today and to the sonnets. You can always go back and look at the ones that we've done earlier. Uh, so uh, remember that uh, a sonnet is a 14-line poem written in iambic pentameter with an intricate rhyme scheme, usually about love. Iambic pentameter means we've got 10 syllable long lines. Um, its intricate rhyme scheme is um, defined by end rhyme, usually composed of couplets, quatrains, sestets, and octaves. Uh, we read a Shakespearean um, sonnet last time. Uh, it's got three quatrains and a couplet. Uh, Shakespeare has really defined his style by the time he hits sonnet 116, which is what we're reading now. Note that Shakespeare's sonnets are not about unrequited love. They're about love for somebody that he's in a relationship with, as opposed to some unattainable, perf perfect love. Um, we'll look at his sound devices, we'll look at his figurative language, uh, we'll look at symbols. All of those things are present in Sonnet 116, which we're going to read today. So uh, let me just start out by reading it to you. Sonnet 116 by William Shakespeare. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no. It is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is a star to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool. Though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come, love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be error, and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. Whew. Okay. Let's do the rhyme scheme. All right, so mines is our first one. It's definitely A. Um, oops, I guess I put it in the wrong spot. No, let's try that again. Um, it's A. Uh, love is going to be new. It's B. Finds is A. Remove. Remember with the vowel shift, remove and louve um, are going to rhyme. Mark is brand new. It's C. Shaken is brand new it's d bark goes with mark taken goes with shaken cheeks is new uh if you see e come is new weeks goes with cheeks doom and come do, doom and cum um you gotta read it with that accent again that's an f and proved and lubed are g g now you're like wait we got love and remove but we we eliminate in both of these a vowel sound to make it fit the meter so it doesn't have the same vowel sound um, as it would otherwise. So we clearly have one, two, three, and I'm artificially separating this. Asana isn't separated into stanzas, but it's easier for you to interpret and understand when you separate it this way. This one is a more true rhyme scheme to the Shakespearean mold. Also, you can look and see that he's not trying to make it into a octave and a sestet here. Uh, we got a period at the end of the first quatrain, a period at the end of the second quatrain, a period at the end of the third quatrain, and a period at the end of the couplet. So it's very clearly separated not only by rhyme scheme, but also by sentence structure. Uh, to to fit um, this idea of, of creating a meaning. Uh, it's 14 lines. Uh, let me not to the marriage of true minds. Ten, ten syllables. Admit impediments. Love is not love. Ten syllables. It's going to go that way all the way through. So it is iambic pentameter. You should be able to go through and count those syllables. Uh, so let's uh let's break it down let's see what we've got here this is shakespeare's true love sonnet in case you didn't pick that up from the first read which i wouldn't expect you to uh the whole poem is dedicated to defining what true love is very different from unrequited love uh and he starts out with a very bold first quatrain let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments so that not he's saying that there are no impediments there are no obstacles to the marriage of true minds. So if you're in true love with somebody, he starts out with this first sentence. Um, there, there's no way there will be an obstacle to that love. Nothing can get in the way of true love. Uh, distance, no big deal. Age gap, no big deal. Um, nothing, nothing will stop you. Culture, nope. 
Uh, so the idea here is that uh, there, there's nothing that can stop true love. If your love is stopped by something, well, then it wasn't true love. Uh, if, it, if it's true love, it can't possibly be stopped. Then he says, love is not love which alters when alteration finds. So he says, if you're in love with somebody and you're like, I love everything about them, but get out. That's not true love. That's not a real relationship. Uh, you can't alter when you find alteration. You can't bend with a remover to remove. I think that's a sort of a metaphor for weeding a garden. You know, like when you're in love with somebody, but you want them to change something about themselves. If you ask somebody to change themselves, then you don't love them for who they are. You're trying to make them change. And therefore that relationship isn't good. If that person changes and then you no longer love them, because they're not the person that you fell in love with them initially, then it wasn't true love. You loved them for who they were, not who they are, and it's not unconditional because you're not gonna love them no matter what. Uh, so essentially what he's saying here is, it doesn't matter how a person changes. If it's true love, you'll always love them. It doesn't, you'll never ask somebody to change. If it's true love, you'll always love them. So um, a person starts smoking, you know, like they they do meth. I don't know. Whatever. It's not going to change how you feel about them uh, if it's true love. So he makes this bold statement about true love in our first stanza. In our second stanza, we're going to bring in some sort of symbols, some images to represent. He says, oh, no, it is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. So when you see this, it is love, right? And is is a clue that we've got a metaphor here. Um, and the metaphor, I think, has a pretty clear image. Oops, I just italicized that. Didn't want to do that. Um, the image is that of, of, I don't know, a rock in a storm at sea, a tempest. Uh, a tempest is a storm at sea, and so the, the image is this, this big rock, this big boulder sitting in the ocean with a spray, like, foaming around. It doesn't matter how hard the ocean comes at that boulder. It is ever fixed. It is always going to stay there. It is never shaken by the wind, by the sea, by the storm surge, nothing. Uh, so the metaphor here is... That's what love is. You know, the tempest is life. Life comes at us hard. There's lots of things that that shake us or, or change us. But love is a constant. If you have real love in your life, it will weather all the storms. The storms can bring what they want and your love will last through them all. So that's, that's the first uh, sort of symbol or metaphor, if you will. Um, you know, this image of the, the tempest or the hurricane of your life breaking around the rock of your love, which is stable and strong. Uh, then he says, it is the star to every wandering bark. Bark is a word that we don't use much anymore. Um, a bark was an old word for a ship. Uh, we still have, you know, traces of it because when you get on a ship, you're embarking. And when you get off a ship, you're disembarking. Uh, but people don't use the word bark to refer to a ship anymore. I think partially it was called a bark because it was made out of wood, right? And, and it floated. So, you know, anyway, um, it is the star, though. It is, again, indicates that uh, we've got a metaphor. Metaphorically, love is a star to a wandering ship. Okay, you're the ship. This is a metaphor. Um, if you're a ship at sea and you have nothing to steer by and you don't know where you're going, how do you navigate? Well, back then they, they didn't have GPSs. They had what's called celestial navigation. You looked at the star, particularly the North Star, which stayed fixed in the sky, and you set your course by that. Shakespeare says that is love. If you've got to set your course by something in life, you set your course by love. If it's true love, it's stable. It doesn't move. It's ever fixed in the sky, and you can set your course by it. It's pretty, pretty romantic again. Uh, he says that the star is worth unknown, although its height be taken. You can measure uh, your life by it, but it's impossible. It's, it's one of those things that's priceless. It's impossible to value. Um, so, We've got two stanzas now, or two stanzas, two quatrains now. I've separated them so they look like stanzas, but remember, it's all 14 lines of contiguous poetry. He says, true love never changes, never asks for change. Um, 
it's it's ever fix it. It'll get you through the hard hardships of life. It'll help you set your course. Uh, you'll be able to gu guide yourself through life by your love. Uh, then he moves into a third quatrain. He says, love's not time's fool. Well, time is capitalized. That's a personification of time as if it's a person. Um, so I think you're supposed to picture a sort of father time there. Though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickles compass come. I love that line. It's beautiful. Uh, he says, you know what? Love doesn't change with time either. People people age. You know, their hair turns gray or falls out. Um, they get wrinkled. They put on weight. They lose weight. Um, they get sick. You know, these things happen. Uh, but love is not time's fool. Love does not change with time. If it's true love, it's a constant. It's ever fixed. It's going to stay. Uh, and so, you know, love alters not, he says, with his his goes back to time times brief hours and weeks but bears it out even to the edge of doom so he's you know picturing two people growing old together and holding arthritic hands as they as they near death uh right so love lasts through the test of time and you know i, I think we've all we've all known some old folks that are are um you know married 50 years or more um you know, and, and that's that's what Shakespeare's talking about here. That the love, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many years go by. I'm I'm, I'm married. What? It's gonna be seventeen years this year for me. Um, and uh, you know, I, I don't notice the changes. Hopefully, my wife doesn't notice the changes either. Uh, but you see it every day. I think this is this is Shakespeare's on point here. Um, you don't notice. When, you, when you're with somebody every day, you don't notice the years passing. You don't notice the changes. I still look at my wife and see the woman I married. I don't, I, because the changes are so gradual. It's like when you live with your parents um, and you see them aging and then suddenly you see a picture of them when you were like, I don't know, five and you're like, whoa, what happened to you? Uh, right, and, and that's, you know, you'll go off to college and then you'll come home and, and you'll see the changes in a way or, or you'll go off and get a job and move out of state or whatever, and you'll come home and you'll see the changes in a way that you didn't when you were living there. Um, so I think there's something something to be said for what Shakespeare's saying here that when you don't notice the changes when you when you live in a relationship with somebody. Love is not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickles compass come. That sickle, of course, is Father Time holds a sickle, but it it harkens back to. Um, the Grim Reaper and the idea of death. And you have that come out in Dune here at the end. Uh, so all of this so far is pretty good. But then Shakespeare likes to throw a resolution at you at the end. And Shakespeare has developed this, this sort of new thing. You didn't see it so much in Sonnet 29, but you see it in his later sonnets, um, where he likes his resolution to sort of be a sucker punch that just gets you in the jaw and changes your interpretation or sort of flabbergasts you about the poem itself. And that's definitely what Shakespeare does here. He ends his sonnet with this line. If this be error and upon me proved, I never writ nor no man ever loved. So what does he say here? Let's translate. He says, if I'm wrong about this, I'm wrong about everything. Love doesn't exist and burn everything I've ever written. That's a bold statement from a guy who wrote this. Uh, this is the collected Shakespeare uh, it's it's a lot of work, and Shakespeare's just like burn it. Uh, it's it's uh, nothing I've written has value. If I'm wrong about this, I'm wrong about everything. And so it's a pretty bold statement about love. That love, nothing can stop true love. That love never changes or asks for change. That it will get you through the hardest moments of your life. Uh, that it will help you find guidance when you don't know where to go or what to do, that it will stand the test of time, um, then if you can find true love, as, as he, I mean, there's a consistency to his message. Uh, it makes you more rich than a king. Go back to the last sonnet. Um, it is the most valuable thing in the world. And if I'm wrong about true love, nothing matters. <laughs> you know, like that's essentially what he, what he says here down at the end. So, um, Question, do you agree uh, with uh, Shakespeare's you know, definition of love? Is this what true love is? Uh, I think he's, he's got it pegged. Again, look at the maturity of this sonnet and, and the message here, as opposed to 
you know, Sydney and Spencer. Um, this sauna is not as polished. Again, oh, I guess I haven't done um, sound devices. Let me let me pause and fill them in. Uh, that way you won't have to watch me do it slowly. So many, many more sound devices here. Uh, let me not, you got your, your uh, consonants there. Marriage minds, you got alliteration. Admit impediments, I, I, is. All of that is an I sound that's repeated. You got a repeated T in admit and not an impediment. You also have S and impediments and is. Uh, that's a really compli complex line. Um, you got remover and remove. Uh, you've got O and no, that's assonance. It and is, um, that's um, assonance. Uh, you got fixed goes with it and is too. You got locks, tempests, and is, that's consonance. Star and wandering bark and all of that is assonance. Who's worth, um, that's consonants known and although uh, is assonance. You can see that he does a good job. Um, loves, times, uh, and lips, and cheeks, all, there's four that have consonants with an S here. Rose E is a hard E sound, and cheeks is an E sound as well. His uh, and compass both have the S sound and sickles. All three of them have, have the S sound. Um, bending and sickles and within, they, they have the I sound. And, um, compass and cum both obviously have alliteration and um, assonance. Um, alters and his both have the S sound, so does weeks and hours. So we got four S's uh, in consonants at the end of this one. Brief and weeks both have the same assonance sound. But, it, out. So, like, he does a good job of using sound devices to unify the poem. Um, not nearly as many, and I think this is intentional, in his um, resolution. The re resolution is meant to be jarring, and so one of the interesting things Shakespeare does is he makes a lot of the rest of it smooth and then changes the rhyme scheme for the couplet at the end and also tends to leave it more devoid of sound devices so that it hits hard, um, feels, feels different. Uh, and I think that comes across as well. All right. So um, I'm going to shut this video down. Thanks for your, your time and attention. I uh, hope you enjoy this one. I certainly do.